the battle between trademarks and AI on today's episode with special guest Andre Minkov. Today's episode is brought to you by Namecheap. There is no better option when it comes to buying your domain names. I've been a customer for more than a decade, and it's been a dream experience. Secure your new business name today at servenomaster.com, Namecheap. Are you tired of dealing with your boss? Do you feel underpaid and underappreciated? If you want to make it online, fire your boss, and start living your retirement dreams now, then you've come to the right place. Welcome to the Artificial Intelligence Podcast, where you will learn how to use artificial intelligence to open new revenue streams and make money while you sleep. Presented live from a tropical island in the South Pacific by best-selling author Jonathan Green. Now, here's your host. Now, I'm always interested in, especially now with trademarks, it's gotten crazy because Amazon made their new rule that everyone has to have a brand name. And so the number of people submitting trademarks has like skyrocketed, right? So you see every brand on Amazon is like this like weird name that's a random combination. It seems to be six letters. So now trademarking has, it seems to me has gotten so different than when I got my trademark just five and a half years ago. It was like such an easy process for me. But now doing a trademark search, you never know what's going to come up because I've seen some like small words get trademarked, all sorts of crazy stuff. So how has that really changed even before AI made things even crazier over the past year? It yeah, starts- so trademarking has changed really with the speed of dissemination of information. If you think back to, I don't know, 100 years ago, it took companies a long time to set up a brand and for others to copy that brand. Companies used to have this leeway when they didn't have to run to the office the second they came up with a brand. Right. And with the internet, with e-commerce, the more we have that, the easier it is for someone in China to replicate what, what you're doing, the more important it becomes to file your trademarks as early as possible, because really it's never too early, but often too late to do that. And as you said correctly, with Amazon pushing their brand registry, that becomes even more important. So to give you stats for to me, that's absolutely mind blowing. So in Canada, they file about 70,000 trademarks every year. In US, they file about 700,000 trademarks every year. And in China, they file about 7 million trademarks. And what China does, and they're trying to figure out a way to stop this. Basically in China, they, what they do is they trademark pretty much everything, just re- all random combinations of characters. And then they try to sell them to, to, to people with actual brands. That's really why we always say to business owners, what you need to figure out is, can I get a domain name with that? And can I get a trademark? If the answer to either of these two is no, pick a different name. Yeah. I'm always amazed that I got mine. Like I got servenomaster.com and mine not that long ago, like 2016. Like I just assumed when I typed in, I go, this has to be gone Hmm. because it's, Clever. I was like, all the two word ones were already gone, but even getting a free word one now, I can't even imagine. And it's really, then I don't have a unique name. So there are so many Jonathan Greens. I'm like the eighth most famous Jonathan Green, which is still pretty good because it's such a common name. But some people get away with they have a unique enough name that could become their brand. But it's very interesting how to deal with exactly that, which is that every domain name, every brand, if you're even become famous, I remember when it started 20 years ago, people would buy the domain name of your name. As soon as you got a part in the movie, if you didn't think of it or started your band, if you didn't think of it, then you suddenly found someone squatting your domain. Now that people are squatting on your trademark, like that's even tougher because the question is really, it seems like this is an area that AI is making things worse because AI could just spit out trademark applications, all of these things very quickly. Are AI, are trademark applications just way cheaper in China? Short answer is yes, but there's also less of them previously filed. So there's a lot more that you can do there. Plus they're not as, they have different rules of examination. Basically their approach to likelihood of confusion is different from, let's say American, right? And uh, it, the way I see it, the trademarking laws will have inevitably need to change at some point. I don't know when. There's really two big flaws that become more and more obvious. One is the extraterritoriality. Basically, when you get a trademark, you only get it for one for the country where you file it for. 
And if you want to protect your brand globally, you have to file your trademark everywhere. Whether you do it with a Madrid application or you do it directly, it still costs a shit ton of money, right? And the bigger problem with that is not just that it costs a lot of money, it's that usually you'd be able to get your brand somewhere, but not somewhere else. And so Burger King couldn't get Burger King in Australia, their Hungry Jack's there, right? And there's a lot of examples like this. So they'll have to figure out a way around, around this because again, when the system was initially designed, it was okay because again, the, the, the growth, the scaling internationally happened so much slower and copying happened so much slower than it does now. And so nobody thought that this would be the case when you could click a button, have a website five minutes later and sell your stuff to anyone anywhere. All right. And the second thing that they will also need to change is that this trademarking system is based around goods and services. So when you come up with a name, you don't get a monopoly over that name in vacuum. You get a monopoly over that name in connection with specific products and services that you're selling to the market. And similarly, back in the day when they came up with the system, they thought that, hey, if you're making refrigerators, you're going to be making refrigerators under that brand. You're not going to be selling t-shirts. You're not going to be selling educational courses, how to fix a fridge. Like you're not going to do any of that. And now there's more and more businesses that say, we actually do a lot more than one thing. Do we have to file in 45 classes? And so I think eventually they'll need to, to, to figure, to figure this out. And one thing that might change it all is something like Amazon brand registry, really, because it's not going to be a formal government registration, but if there is a platform where you can sell stuff and you can't be there unless you're registered and that the registration there happens with some other rules, maybe that will take over the, the government registration. It's probably not something that's going to happen tomorrow, probably not something that's going to happen five years from now, but eventually something like this will probably We'll start C. So for someone who's starting out this process, right? I know a lot of people go, let me figure out my business name with Chad GPT. Now it's not really private, a hundred percent private, right? Because you're doing it online and you know, their database has everything, whatever they mm -hmm. say, it's still stored somewhere. Right? So what is the right approach to using AI to coming up with your business name or to coming up with your logo? Cause if you come up with your logo using an AI image generator, do you actually own that logo because it's made by an AI and AI can't own an image, right? So that's, you know, they keep going to court with that. They say, oh, you're not an artist. If the AI makes it in between, you have to do something yourself or it doesn't count. What about that area? Like with creating your logo? That's a good, great question. Let's start with the logo question. Cause I think you asked two questions and I'll start with the second logo. What you're referring to is authorship, which is copyright who created the image. And that's very separate from your trademarking rights because trademark rights, they don't care who designed this for you. Like the Nike swoosh, they paid the artist 35 bucks for, for the image and they went and trademarked that. And now it's worth billions of dollars as a brand. So they didn't ask Nike at the trademark office, what was the name of the artist who drew that for you? They don't care. All they care about is they were the first to go and request that as their brand. And unless there was someone who raised their hand and said, by the way, Nike stole it from me because I designed it. That was the end of it, right? Because you can't take someone else's image and claim it as your trademark. Then in that case, copyright could prevail. But when AI does that, there's no offer, right? It's work of the machine. And some works that would not qualify for copyright protection, for example, the green square, right? It's not, it's not something that could be protected by copyright, but it is something that could be protected by a trademark, like H&R Block, right? So that's really, I hope answers your question about the logo. As for your question about the names, it's really not about always coming up with some genius super original name, like Apple, again, great example, right? You can find something more common than Apple, yet it's one of the most valuable brands in the world, right? And so you don't need AI to come up with that. What you need is 
is an idea that, hey, we can use this word and start doing something with it. it has nothing to do with selling apples, right? Which is how, what they did. But like I, if Steve Jobs at some point said, you know what, let's not call it apple, let's call it a plum, right? How different would it be or uh, orange or mango, whatever, right? It's not just about coming up with a genius name. It's about what you do with it. So with ChatGPT, same, same thing, right? It can't suggest stuff that's good. It can't suggest stuff that's crappy. What's more important to business owners and entrepreneurs from a long-term perspective is not that you came up with a perfect name, is that you came up with a name that, that you can own. Because if it's too similar to something that already exists, it doesn't matter how good it is. You will never own it. You will never be your brand. Owning a brand is better than having the brand. Yeah, I think that we, the thing that people have discovered is that with Amazon, you see all these like random letter name brands still selling a ton of units that people don't actually care as much about brand as we thought, right? If the product seems okay, it has enough reviews. And obviously that's led to lower quality products getting flooding the market, but that's something I've seen that's interesting because everyone just assumed the big brands would still dominate, right? Because you go, oh, I could buy shoes from this company. Why would I buy shoes from XRE4, right? That's not a real company. Maybe it is now, but that's exactly what they found out is that, oh, you can have a really random drop shipping brand name and do okay. So is the value of, is the value of a brand being changed by the way the market is shifting, especially in the past year? Has is the value of actual brands diminishing because we're seeing, oh, people just care about the thing. So it's funny you should say that because I created a graph a couple months ago that was like, to, I, woke, I had a dream with it and then I woke up and I put it together. So when you come up with a brand, like the moment the owner thinks of whatever combination of letters, images, whatever, that moment when they come up with it, the value of that brand is zero because right? nobody knows about it. All it has is potential value, right? That's one thing. And also at that very moment, your brand is the most registrable it will ever be. Because as you start putting stuff out there, you'll start putting money into ads, you'll put, start putting money and time and efforts into marketing and getting that brand known to other people. The, Every day that passes by, the value hopefully goes up because more people find out about you and uh, hopefully you're doing something good. So the value goes up and the registrability goes down because there, it increases the risk that someone's going to say, oh, this QRSTP 427 seems like a good brand. Why don't I get a trademark on that? And then it's up to you to fight this. So really it goes like this, right? So. From that point, it goes, the, the value goes up, registrability goes down. And the longer you play this game, the wider the chasm be between the two. And uh, you don't want to be in a situation when you've actually built something really valuable only to find out that, whoops, I can't have it. So if that answers your question. Yeah. So when should someone... I guess it's because I've seen a lot of these people that have an idea and then they spend... Sixty-five or a hundred thousand dollars registering trademarks around the world before they know if anyone wants their product, and then they go, "Oh, that was our whole budget." They spend their entire marketing and sales budget on trademarks, and there's this thing of, "I get you want to secure it, but you don't know if it's a good idea." And I see this happen. It's the same thing when people buy a ton of inventory before they've sold any units. They go, "Oh, we got the best deal for buying twenty thousand units." Yeah, and then they spend the rest of their life with a warehouse paying warehouse <laughs> fees for something that they because now you have to pay yep. to store it. And I, this is why I don't like to sell physical products. People ask me why I only do print on demand and digital. This is why. That's my nightmare is to have a warehouse full of stuff no one wants. Yeah. So where is the, when is the right moment to grab your trademark? Should you just get the first version, like just get the trademark just in your home country right out the gate and then deal with other countries later? Because it can get, as worldwide is so expensive. And are you really going to do business in Czechoslovakia and in Brazil? Yeah. And in Korea, it's probably not all of them. Yeah. So we have four rules of thumb about it. One is, yeah, you always start with your home country because that gives you all the flexibility and also buys you six months of grace period during which you can 
f- file anywhere else and backdate your applications to the date of your application in your home country, right? Which is not something that would work if you start with some other country. So you always start at home. Second is you put countries where you think uh, you're going to have a lot of revenue from. So if, I don't know, if you're a Canadian business, but most of your sales are from the U.S., U.S. is going to be the territory where you want that trade. To me, the magic number is around, if you think that you're going to be making at least 30K a year from that country, get a trademark there. Third is you get a trademark everywhere where you have significant expenses. So if you have an office, if you target ads to a specific country, get a trademark there. And to me, that is about 5K a year. If you deliberately spend money on a country, get a trademark there. And last one is if you make physical stuff somewhere, like you've got a factory in China, get a trademark in China, because if you don't and someone else trademarks it, they may prevent you from exporting your own products out of China to sell to the U.S. Because the act of exportation qualifies as trademark infringement if someone else owns that trademark, right? So you don't have to try to sell anything to China to get hit by someone else trademarking a brand in China. So that's the one that most people don't know about. And that's, that, that, that creates a lot of headache for business owners, right? So that's really the game, but you said it right. You start with your home country because that buys you six months anyway, right? So what I suggest people do is file your trademark, start small because a trademark in one country is not going to break your bank. If you're serious about building this as a business. Regardless of who you go with, if you go with the most expensive law firm, you go with us, you go with some of those cheap websites, it's still not going to break your bank, right? But do it, right? And then see if people want your product. And if they do, then keep expanding your trademark portfolio. Yeah, I think that's some really good advice because most people either think go all in or don't do it. There's no middle. So I like to have very specific numbers. That thing about just another reason why I don't like to do physical products, like just another surprise. And I know a lot of people get caught up in categories like, oh, I thought I was only going to make electronics. Now I'm doing t-shirts and someone can grab the t-shirts category. And different countries have different category lists, right? So they might not exactly match up. They're very close. So pretty much the whole world uses this niche classification which breaks down all possible products and services into 45 categories that call them classes. There are some minor distinctions how countries approach this, different wordings here and there, but generally it's roughly the same. Okay. And how has AI changed the process of trademarking in the past year or the past two years? can't remember where I heard this, but I think it's really, it was really well said that a lot of people think of AI is that we're going to have some war between humans doing the work and AI replacing humans doing all that work for them. And where in fact, that's how it's going to work. Really what's going to happen is we're going to have a war between people who use AI and people who don't. And people who are not going to use AI, they're going to do things slower, probably miss out a lot of things, but you still need humans, right? So what AI does simplify a lot like all those trademark search systems that we're using, like we're using paid software to do that, they have their internal AI that evaluates likelihood of confusion and this and that. Uh, first, we use that, right? The other stuff we use in trademark factories business, there's this wonderful AI. T- I can't recommend this enough. It's called Olympia. And uh, what they do is basically they set themselves off as your own look chatting with there's eight or 10 personalities. Like you got a marketing expert, they got a legal expert, you got this and this, you got programmers. And we chat with it all the time and ask it a bunch of questions. It helps us with some of our marketing. We don't really use it to draft applications because I think that I would never, I would never rely on it fully, but we do rely on searches. We do rely on it finding similar products and services that it does really well. And eventually when AI will have access to the databases of cases of case law, that will be very interesting because then, then you'll be able to very quickly see what responses to office actions work, which don't, how to phrase it and things like that. So 
I think you brought up something really important, which I want to make sure doesn't slip past people, that a big reason to hire a trademarking firm or a trademarking lawyer is mm-hmm. not even just the application, it's actually the research part, which is the, will my application get rejected? And you mentioned it, and it's called like possibility of confusion, which is my logo or my name, which I'm trademarking, too similar to something that already exists. And the research process has... And that's a hard question. Do two things look too similar? I remember when I was first trying to do this stuff and my dad had his law firm do something and they sent me a bunch of stuff and I was like, this is insane. <laughs> it just Because they just searched like circle. And I was like, of course, there's a million things to circle. Like I just trademarked my words. I was like, I don't care about the logo. I change my logo every couple of years. We change what it looks like. It's not intrinsic to my brand because it's not on like your shoes or your shirt, right? It's not as important when you're an e-commerce brand. You can change what it looks like. It's not 100%. a big deal. And I learned, oh, if you trademark the image and then you change the font, now you have to redo it. And I was yep. like, oh my God, no thanks. <laughs> <laughs> no thanks. I don't care that much about what the image is in the back because I change what I want in the background anyway. So that part of the research of are things too similar can, and it sounds like the tools you like AI tools will give you a shorter list. Are they good at going, oh, these are similar, knowing the line? And because it's really the line of what the inspector at the, at least in America, USPTO office is going to go, oh, these are too similar or not. Because you're getting, a, at the end of the day, it goes to a person who makes that final decision. goes, this is too similar. This is not. I know of cases where you send it to one, they reject it. You send it right back in, changing nothing, and then it gets approved, right? Because it's just yeah. a different person reviewed it. So yeah. Are AI tools helpful with that particular thing? Now, for someone who's trying to do it themselves or doing that initial research phase to cut down on the cost. So with search, it's it's actually very cool to have a conversation with you because so much of this and with searching and providing registrability opinion, really it's about two things. One is the universe of uh, marks that it finds, that, that it thinks could be potentially confusing, I, and two, making the right conclusions based on what, and if you don't have access to the full universe, if it, if it finds some trademarks, but doesn't find some others, if it's not reliable, then you have a massive problem. And that's really the big problem with all of those three trademark searches that you can see online, because they only look at identical matches, usually, for registered trademarks. And that's just tip of the iceberg. On the other hand, if you get too many, you have a problem with how do you figure out what's relevant and what isn't. You need to understand what to look for. The USPTO has recently changed their interface for our trademark searches. It, it was bad, but at least it was, it was pretty full and it was usable. It looked like shit, but it was usable. Now they changed it. Now it looks very modern, but the quality of the searches went down like this. And I'm sure that they're using their variation of AI to do that. And I remember a couple of years ago when we were shopping for the platform to do our trademark searches for, because we file a lot of trademarks for our clients. Obviously we need a reliable source of that information. We were trying to make that decision because it's always a compromise, right? When you do a search, you don't want to go through 30,000 trademarks because you can do that, but you also don't want to have five and realize that, whoops, it didn't show this and this and this, and those would actually kill the registrability of your application. We ended up with a solution that we thought was, uh, would provide the perfect balance. So that's the problem. So laymen don't know right? They really, nobody knows because you're, you're dealing with the results that, you, that, you're, that they give you, right? If they don't give you certain results, you assume that they're not there. And unless you have the luxury of comparing what would this system give me if I search for this, what's this system give me if I search for this, that system, and then you compare and then you. Yeah, that's really interesting because when I first did my USPTO application, the website was so terrible looking, but I watched their training videos and followed the process and everything was actually a really smooth experience. But I know that since then, things have gotten a lot crazier. I don't know. So (laughs) with the change in their website design and with the fact that there are so many more trademarks, 
how like how many trademarks do you want to get back in a result? What's the ideal number? You go, okay, this makes sense to me. Do you expect to, when you do a search, you expect to get back a hundred, you expect to get back 500 that you go through manually. What's the number? Like when you chose your software, you go, oh, this is the sweet spot because five is too few, 30,000 is too many. What's the kind of number you expect where you go, wait, something's wrong if this number is too low or too high? It really depends on the brand, right? If it's just a random combination of letters, you probably don't want too many. You'd probably be okay with, I don't know, 10, 20. If you're looking at a tagline made up of three common words, you'd probably be looking at, I don't know, 100 and 100, 200. So internally we have our own, that's our secret sauce. That's how we have 99.3% rate of success with our trademarking services, right? Which is way higher than anyone else in this industry. And really the secret sauce is by doing searches that allow us to predict whether the trademark is going to go through or not and help business owners not waste time and money on stuff that's not going to go through. And for, if it's a combination of, if it's a tagline, right? Two, three words or four words, whatever. We're going to search every single word. We're going to search different combination. We're going to search synonyms. We're going to search different languages. We're like, in US, we will translate this in Spanish. We're going to translate this in Canada, we're going to translate this into French and things like that, right? And we're going to play around with that. So it's going to be multiple queries. And for each, yeah, I probably want to want to see somewhere between maybe 10, 50. But there's going to be multiple approaches, multiple kicks. Again, I would rather us do those queries than fully rely on AI to do it. For now, you know, one, once, once, once they learn how to do it, I'm more than happy to save our searcher's time and just click one button. Yeah, because I think that's an interesting future because most people don't think it's the coming up with a good idea and it's really the search. Is it going to get approved? Because now the response time has gotten way longer. Yeah. I know that for a lot of people it takes more than a year, which I, that blows my mind because I got mine very quickly. Canada, Even in, four I, years now. You have to yeah, wait like, four years till initial examination in Canada. Can you believe that? That's ridiculous. Like how many businesses are you going to survive four years? <laughs> and it's like, you don't know because you have to renew in America. You have to renew it five years and you have to prove you're using the thing. I have no, the first one's at five because I have to do one. They just it's not renew, it's stuff. maintenance between the fifth and sixth anniversary. Yeah, sorry, that's right. so I have to prove I'm still using it is yeah. what I mean. I use the wrong word. You're right. But I have to prove, and I have to prove each category. So I have to show an example of each of my categories. I have to go and remember what categories I did. <laughs> and as I'm sure, I'm, I think I did four and I'm probably still using at least three or four of them. I never, the thing that is confusing is clothing because it's, I don't sell a lot of clothing, right? But if I put a hat or a t-shirt, it's going to have that on it. So do I care that much? And it's interesting because there is someone who's infringing on my copyright. There is a t-shirt out there that says serve the master and it's like a motorcycle t-shirt. And it, there's no confusion for me. No one looks at that and goes, oh, that's Jonathan's motorcycle gang. So I just have never, I haven't bothered because it's what's the point? What are they selling? One t-shirt a month. It just happens to come up if I search looking for infringing. I was like, it doesn't matter to me. You have to make that decision. It's like, is there enough money in suing someone who has one t-shirt that has my brand name on it that probably doesn't sell that much and making an enemy of a motorcycle gang? Probably not worth it because it's like such a small thing. But <laughs> the... Yeah, it's now the importance of getting, because it takes so long to find out if you've gotten it, right? <laughs> Wait, by the time I get it, I have to prove I'm still using it. Now yeah. I have to do the maintenance thing and then I have to renew it. And it's like, so it, the delay, and I just wonder, it's like, I wish that their office would learn to use AI to do things faster because really what you want to get is a same day, yes or no. <laughs> I don't want to wait four years to find out, oh no, you've, this has never been your brand. That's so scary. So now... It's interesting because my opinion has always been, because I did it on my own and I got it. And now I'm like, maybe I got really lucky. I followed the steps. I watched their train. Their training videos were so boring on the website, but I was like, nobody watches these. I just followed them step by step. It was very methodical and it worked. And of course, as soon as you submit, you get hundreds of emails from law firms that go, you totally messed up. You're never going to get this. We'll fix it for you. And then I got it first try. They go, no. Then I got the letter from USPTO with the cool thing. He goes, no, you got it. Great job. You did it on your own. Amazing. No one ever watches our videos. We're so happy you're approved. Yep. And 
part of it was that I was already using the brand. I owned the domain name. I had a podcast with that name. I have a book published under that name that's a bestseller that's done really well. So like I established my usage of it and nobody else was super similar. Obviously the word serve can be server and there's a lot there and there's a lot with no. What am I going to do? Everyone has no. So there was definitely a lot of things that came up that could have been a confusion, but they weren't in the same category. So I just think now... But also I got it in two or three months. Now the thought of waiting a year or four years, like, holy, it's so scary. So now I think my opinion has shifted. In the US, it's about 14 months now. Like the whole process. Yeah. Start to... <laughs> like, yeah. That's so long. Yeah. So I waited two, I was like, I have to wait three months. This is crazy. The thought of waiting and finding out in a, more than a year. So I have to do my maintenance thing, of course, which is like a simpler form because I've already approved, but it's like, yeah. golly, they've made it so, look, so that you- uh, what you're saying really is a testament to, yes, you can do it yourself. The, you're the one of the lucky 19% who file their own application and it goes through without any issues. But 81% of self-filed applications get an office action, at least one, right? Yeah. And the SPTO's own statistics is that out of all applications filed, whether they filed by self-represented applicants or they filed with the most expensive law firms, only 51.7% of trademark applications ever get approved. I don't think you got lucky. I think you know more about trademarks and how the system works than 99% of people out there. So there's something to that where right? you took the time to figure that out. A lot of people, they're like, I came up with this name. That's my trademark. And when you tell them, hey, there's government fee, there's classes, there's re the requirement to show use, they're like, what are you talking about? But they have no idea, right? So we have to educate them. But when they file on their own, they assume that they know everything. So this is something to me as the founder and CEO of this company, that's been the most mesmerizing thing because the extent of, of certainty of people, of how much they know, and how much they really know, it's just a vast difference, right? We use different forms to get people to book a call with one of our strategy advisors. And we used to ask two questions. Like that was one of the experiments that we ran. One was basic, one was, you know, how much do you, how certain are you about what you want to file, why you want to file, how much you understand about trademarks? One is I know everything. And the other option was I'd rather watch a short video that explains me that. And the second question was, second screen was, how much, how well do you understand trademark factories offer and how we're different from everyone out there? And was like, I know exactly what I want. I, I picked the package. I know exactly what I want. And the other one, I don't mind watching a short video that explains me all that. Well, guess what? The 90% of people said they know everything about trademarks. They know everything about trademark factory. Then they get on the phone and they advise, great. So what do you want to trademark and which package? And like, what are you talking about? I have no idea. It's called me. And so yeah. a lot of people, they think they understand trademark. They think they understand how the system works. They think it's like the main name. You come up with some combination, you submit it to the government, click a button, pay them 20 bucks. And then five minutes later, you own this. Not so much with trademarks. Yeah. I think that what people think at LLC or getting that tax ID number is really hard. Yeah. When it's actually crazy easy. Yeah. They'll fax, they'll fax it to you. So you have to have a fax machine. That's the hard part. That's the hardest part is they want to fax it to you. So you have to get an online fax machine to get it, to receive it. That's the one hard part, but it takes 30 minutes. So that department is shockingly easy because <laughs> you think, oh, business tax city, that's going to be so hard. So easy. Yeah. But then the trademark thing. Yeah. I, because I knew someone who was really good at, he was an inventor and he had massive success with trademarks and lawsuits and stuff. And he was like, just watch their videos and be very methodical. The videos are, they're a tough watch. Let's be honest. They're government made training videos. Of course, they're a tough watch, but it's very interesting to me that this approach of, oh, I know everything. Cause it's really, the form is very confusing. Yeah. Unfortunately, they have a video about each question because the thing about categories, that is really, because you pay per category. So if you go, oh, I need every category. I'm going to do all of the categories. That's so expensive. And then you don't use them. You lose them after five years anyways. And I think that's where a big mistake is made. And then the other thing of my experience was when I looked at that was when I saw the video that explained, oh, if you ask for the image versus just the letters, way 
I was like, you have to, every time you change your logo, you have to redo it because maybe we won't let you have it in a different font. I was like, okay, I'll just do the letters because I don't care that much because it's my domain name. So that's where I got, just because I figured out those two critical steps, I think those were where I would have made the biggest mistake because I've changed my logo since in the last five years, like three or four times. I changed it every two years. I modified a little bit, upgraded it. So that thing is so important. So I think this has been really useful. It's very interesting to see your approach to trademarking, especially with how a lot of things have changed and a lot of people do think, oh, I want to use like the big, the more expensive the law firm, the better the experience I'll get, which is not always true, especially for no. something like that. No. A lot of it is looking at two designs and going, these are too similar. Or these are different enough. That's a very subjective process because that is, that's the thing that it comes down to is someone sitting in an office who's working for the government, which means they already hate their job. And they're looking at two pictures and going, are these two similar. And that's a really weird thing to leverage your entire business on. If you think about it, it's like some person in a room, probably in an uncomfortable chair, making decisions if two images are too similar or they're just different enough that you're allowed to have that be your business and that can change everything. So scary to think about. It's no, been an amazing episode. So give me your final that, thought. Yeah, this was something that I had in mind when I launched Trade My Factory because I realized that to business owners, really, you don't care about what happens in the process. All you care about is the result. Did I get my trademark or I didn't? And uh, it's impossible really because everything is subjective when you tell me hey, we're the better law firm, we're the worst law firm. Like, how do you prove that? The only thing that matters is the result. And so I came up with this concept of offering trademark registration services with a guaranteed result for a guaranteed budget. And everyone told me I was crazy because that's not how legal services are provided. And, uh, uh, when someone tells me it cannot be done, that to me is a sign that I'm on the right. And so we've been running this for all, over 10 years and it's been the best things to us since sliced bread because it's my first business, right? I made a million mistakes in the process, mm -hmm. but the one thing that kept us going is the best offer on the market. And that's very forgiving to a lot of the stupid shit that I've done, like on the marketing front, on the hiring front, because we know that if we can deliver the results that people want, they're going to keep coming back for them. And that's what we've been doing. No, I think it's interesting. Prices are not crazy because I paid, I think, a couple hundred dollars, maybe as much as 500. I can't remember exactly doing it on my own. And your price is not that much of a difference to have to get started with doing it. Whereas I've seen a lot of people that charge tens of thousands, 20,000. It's really expensive. And it's like, there's no guarantee. Very interesting approach. I think what you're doing is very cool. And I definitely know people are going to find this interesting. So people are thinking about trademarking, especially in this world where it takes 14 months now that it takes longer. It's you really, it's not so much paying for what you guys do is as much paying you for saving me from time and headache because yeah. waiting, I have four kids and waiting nine months for a kid to arrive is hard enough. The fact that it's a kid and a half, right? <laughs> That's so long. Wait, yeah. When I think about that scale, cause my wife wants another baby, she brought it up today and I was thinking, oh my gosh, nine months. And right? imagine you're waiting for that and for, out comes a spoon, not a kid. And you're like, wait, yeah. <laughs> that's not what I wanted. And then yeah. that's why it's so important to get it right the first time. Yeah. So I think this is really cool. So everyone, the website is Trademark Factor. I'll make sure to put it in the show notes and below the video. Thank you so much for being here, Andre. This has been a very cool episode and I had a really good time. Thanks for having me, Jonathan, and I look forward to seeing it go live. Thanks for listening to today's episode. Getting that first success with ChatGPT can be daunting. With just one prompt, you can switch ChatGPT into helper mode where it asks you the questions to get a great result. This immediately eliminates the risk of a bad prompt causing a bad result and puts you in the top 10% of ChatGPT users in the world. Get my master prompt absolutely free at artificialintelligencepod.com forward slash master. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of the Artificial Intelligence Podcast. Make sure to subscribe so you never miss another episode. We'll be back next Monday with more tips and tactics on how to leverage AI to escape that rat race. Head over to artificialintelligencepod.com now to see past episodes, leave a review, and check out all of our socials.